Welcome to Conversations from St. Norbert College, a program that encourages good discussion in our community on today's local and global issues. Now, your host for Conversations from St. Norbert College, author, professor, and nationally known sports economist, Dr. Kevin Quinn. Welcome to Conversations from St. Norbert College. I'm Kevin Quinn. Our special guest is author, scholar, and cultural critic, Bell Hooks. Alongside Bell Hooks is the director of the St. Norbert College Cassandra Voss Center, Carlin Crowley. Hooks has been honored as a leading public intellectual by the Atlantic Monthly and has authored more than 35 books and numerous scholarly and mainstream articles. Her writing has addressed race, class, gender, in education, art, history, sexuality, mass media, and feminism. She is a member of the faculty at Berea College, served as scholar in residence at the New School, and in November 2014 will present the keynote address at the National Women's Studies Association Conference in Puerto Rico. Carlin Crowley is an Associate Professor of English and Director of Women's and Gender Studies at St. Norbert College. Crowley's scholarship focuses on gender, religion, American literature, and culture. Welcome to the program. Thank you. I'm happy to be here at St. Norbert. Well, we're thrilled to have you here. So thank you for taking the time uh, to do this. And I want to start off by uh, asking you about your very interesting name. Uh, we talked a little bit about, uh, about this just before we went on air, and uh, you told a great story about how you came to be little b, little h. Well, back in the day when we had little groceries on the corner, I was walking to the grocery and mouthing off, and the person behind the <laughs> counter said, you must be Bell Hook's granddaughter. And I went home and wanted to know from my mother who was Bell Hooks because, of course, Bell Hooks was long dead. And, but she was known to be a person of fiery speech. And so when later in my life as a writer I decided on a pseudonym, I thought, um, I will take the name Bell Hooks. And when I wrote an essay about it that says, when the name Bell Hooks is called, the spirit of my great-grandmother rises. That's wonderful. I'm sure she'd be quite proud of what her, her maybe outspoken uh, granddaughter has, has become. Now, you grew up in southwest Kentucky. Yes. Okay, and what was that like when you were there? Well, growing up in Hopkinsville, Kentucky, was really growing up in the world of tobacco. So when I think of my childhood, I think of fields and fields of tobacco, which is why in my book, Belonging, I try to write a positive chapter about tobacco because I think that many of us confuse our anti-smoking um, beliefs with the fact that tobacco is bad, but that tobacco in and of itself is not a bad crop and has meant many sacred things to, to different groups of people, especially our Native American Indians in Kentucky and elsewhere. Yeah, it's not native to this area, right? It was brought in, is exactly. that correct? You wrote your first book as an undergraduate student. Yes, I was precocious, <laughs> but I must tell people that it was in the top shelf of the closet for some years before I pulled it out and sent it off to South End Press because I was telling people that I'd written this book and they said, oh, there's this little press, um, this little left press that's looking for books on race and gender. So I sent them Ain't I a Woman and that was the beginning and that was by then I was more in my, my towards my late 20s. Do you, do you remember when you got the, the letter that said that they had accepted it for publication? Do you remember what that was like? No, because I remember that they called me and said, we want to accept this book, but we feel that it's very angry. And I was like, angry? I don't understand. And so that was the beginning of me realizing that that bold speech that I had inherited from Bell Hooks, that many people would hear that boldness of speech as anger and not as um, provocative defiance or dissent. And so that was a challenge, but we worked it out. I was able to explain to them. Part of the pleasure of going with a small press was that we could talk things out like that. You know, and that I could say, you know, I notice that a lot of what you think is anger is when you don't agree with me. And uh, <laughs> that's, I think, was a crucial time for me. I have been with South End Press for 40 years. Um, and I have since, you know, published with larger presses, but I have, tried to maintain the integrity of my commitment to a small press, one that can't always pay you or, but, um, you know, we are in, in trouble in our culture with small presses. I was reading that there are only like, something like 10 dedicated women's bookstores in the entire mm -hmm. United States. 
And that was really quite shocking to me. Wow, that is, I, I, I mean, I know that that business has suffered, but I didn't realize that that part of the business had suffered as well, much. Well, many see online book purchasing as one of the things that has really hurt women's bookstores, but I, I think it's deeper than that. I, I think that we were so aware of the need to give one's economic support to the left, to women's issues, in a way that I feel lots of young people are not. Mm -hmm. um, I find that my students really don't want to think about economics, which is a big issue for me. I'm very interested in money and how people use money. Um, and I think that there will come a time, I believe, when we will actually teach people courses about money. Because one of the things we see at Berea, and that I, I know my first great indebtedness came into my life in college. Getting those credit cards in the mail and using them and not facing up to what those interest rates meant. And, um, you know, t accepting all the school loans without really fixating on how will I pay these back. I remember the moment of my life where I realized, wow, I owe $30,000 in student loans and I've never made $30,000. And it was a real sort of shake up, wake up. It's amazing that somebody will give young people <laughs> that amount of money when, when, uh, when they haven't shown any uh, propensity to pay it back. But Well, I was telling Carlin that I started reading uh, money books. Like one of my favorites is Money is My Friend. And um, to learn how to think about money. Because basically, I grew up in the world where people just felt like there isn't any money. And as um, some people would say, debt is the American way of life. And, it was very hard to learn how to go against that. I was just reading Bill Clinton's book, Giving, which is really amazing. It's, it, the stories that he tells of people who give are amazing. People, you know, we know that people who don't make a lot give a lot more mm -hmm. than the people who are billionaires. But, uh, but of the 800 and some billionaires in our nation, it's fascinating to read the kinds of organizations that people have set up for giving, what they do, and, um, and to he read also what the little people do. I always tell people I do homegrown, low-level philanthropy. Like uh, recently I heard of a, a black male student um, who had been out of school, you know, working at a low-wage job who wanted to come back to school, but he couldn't, um, he didn't have the money to pay the debt he owed the college he'd been at, so he couldn't pay, he couldn't get his transcripts. So for me, that's an occasion for low-level philanthropy. I've never met this young man. I know nothing about him other than that he appears to have a deep desire to finish his education. So I'm grateful to have the means to be supportive of that. Well, let's talk actually about a form of philanthropy that's related to your being here, uh, the Cassandra Voss Center. And which, Carlin, you're the director, and it's the Cassandra Voss Center that was uh, fortunate enough to uh, bring you on the campus. So, uh, Carlin, tell us a little bit about that and, and you know, how it got started and, and what you do there. The Cassandra Voss Center is a place that thinks about identity, and we're particularly interested in gender and how it intersects with race and class and sexuality. It's our inaugural year. It's a really beautiful story. It's a story of a building built out of love for a father for his daughter. His daughter, Cassandra Voss, was my student a beautiful, joyful, spirited young woman who was passionate about issues of gender justice and thinking about race and decentering whiteness and how to build inclusive, beautiful community. And when she died in a car accident, her father decided in her spirit and in her honor he would build a building and so he raised $2.8 million to do that. And this is the year of Bell Hooks because it's our first year and so we thought, who else better we could think of nobody else better. If there, I've been saying all year, if there were a feminist Mount Rushmore, Bell Hooks' face would be on it. That would be my next dream. That'll what, be the next what project. What is amazing <laughs> that is that this white male hetero man would be called to love in such a deep and profound way. It is not easy to raise lots of money mm -hmm. to do anything in our culture, but that he wanted very much for people to hold in their hearts and in their mm -hmm. minds the memory of his daughter, a radical feminist thinker, a mm -hmm. believer in social justice. And I'm just, I stand in awe. I stand in awe of the person that she must have been mm -hmm. 
to evoke in him mm -hmm. and to inspire him. But I also stand in awe of him. Mm -hmm. I mean, how many white males in our society, heterosexual white males who are somewhat conservative in some of their belief systems are running around creating a women's center. It's just such, it's, it's beyond uh, mm -hmm. a miracle. Mm -hmm. it's, it's an mm -hmm. amazing mm -hmm. um, call. I mean, one of the it's things okay. that I will be talking about it's at chapel tomorrow uh, is what we are called to. That if you believe that there is a divine plan for your life, then you have to believe that there is a calling on all our lives. So I thought a lot about Cassandra's father, Kurt, and how her death opened up a space of divine calling on his life that he answered. He didn't have to answer. I was telling Carlin that my pastor of my church, Light of the World, in Sarasota, Florida, where I just spent three months, says to all the time, your heart has to be ready to handle the weight of your calling. So I think of Cassandra's father as here he is answering the call through his grief and taking that grief and transforming it into something wondrous and wonderful that few institutions in our nation have. I mean, women's centers are usually like in the ghetto in the back of beyond or in some little basement area. And here we have this radiant, beautiful center that I think people from all over the nation should come to St. Norbert's just to be part of this story and just to see what one person can do in making a difference. As we talk about giving, uh, it's amazing. I, I was at the uh, dedication in the, boy, almost well, a year ago, all I, I guess. Say September is, wow. 18th. And, uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> and I mean, time. it was a moving experience because, you know, he, here was a man who obviously had gone through all these stages of grief, and he was at a point where he could take real joy in what it was that that was going to be here and, and, uh, and the effect it was going to have on, on people's lives for a long time. And, and that's what we're in the business of doing at institutions like this, is you know, having decades long impacts on people's lives. But it's also a real embodiment of, in, in biblical tradition we're told the joy of the Lord is our strength. And so we can see this place of incredible strength mm -hmm. coming from both Cassandra and from her dad. I, I, I want to ask both of you something that uh, we've been talking a little bit about on campus lately, and that's the idea of public intellectualism. We had a meeting the other day about what that, what that means here. And I we, have that meeting in my head all the time. <laughs> what, what, what does it mean? I mean, what is the obligation? What's the, what's the calling there? I have to tell you, Kevin, it's one of the things that I don't feel is a call on my life. I tease people, do you really think that I've written more than 30 books at the, the tender age of 61 by being public? It's a lot of hours <laughs> spent by myself um, in solitude, in preparation, in contemplation. And I think that, to me, the, I receive that um, calling because people place it on me, but I think for me the core of it for myself is a more organic sense of who am I writing for? Who, whose lives are my, am I hoping to transform? And because I have always wanted to reach people beyond the academy, I feel like that has really been part of what called, catapulted me into um, being considered a public intellectual. You know, it's like at one point a group of parents contacted me and said, you know, you, you reach our kids when they're 20, but they're already disturbed. They're already misguided. How about writing books for kids? And I was like, are you kidding? I'm intellectual. I'm not even happy. There's no way that I could <laughs> be somebody who could write books for children. But because of my own devotion to my calling, which I'll be talking about um, at the chapel and to my belief that of being part of a divine plan, I of course took that to meditation and prayer. And I was like, you know, I'm open to it. And then, you know, there I am lying in bed one night and the words to Happy to be Nappy, which was my first children's book, you know, girl pie hair smells clean and sweet. And, you know, I jump out of bed in the middle of the night um, and I begin to write down these thoughts that are in my head. And I'm always stunned when people tell me they don't believe in a higher power, because part of what to me is the essence of spirituality is mystery. 
I have no idea why that was in my head. I have no idea uh, where it came from. I know that in the piece that I wrote, bits and pieces of my childhood, my mother used to make fried pies. Oh gosh, the most wonderful fried pies. And she used to say we were her girl pie. And so there were all those little bits and pieces that came into the book. And it was my first and successful children's book. And so it seems to me that that's part of why people think of me as a public intellectual, because I write across a broad sweep of things addressing an audience of everyday people. I just uh, have been trying, not on the level of Kurt Voss, but I've been trying to start a bell hook center in my little town of 12,000 people. And part of my hope is to bring people to Appalachia, to but to talk with, like my colleague Cornell West, with whom I wrote a book called Breaking Bread. Cornell came, he paid his way, and I bring together people from the hills, ordinary citizens, so that they can actually be in a small group with this renowned intellectual um, and talk to him face to face and learn from him. And that's my hope. I'm a big believer in critical thinking. And the Bell Hook Center is for contemplation, critical thinking, and dreaming. And so far, you know, I, I, t I told Carlin, I'm following the Mary McLeod Bethune model, which is start it in your living room. If you don't have the kind of funds, and if you're not, I am not a fundraiser, you know, but I believe that the essence of living a meaningful life is to have awareness and to be able to engage in critical thinking. And critical thinking isn't a mystery. It's asking yourself who, what, when, where, why, which is one of the reasons that I say children are some of the best critical thinkers because they ask those questions. I remember I will be talking to hundreds of children here. I remember when I first wrote my favorite of my books, B-Boy Buzz, which is all about loving being a boy. And I had my first 100 children, and the question and answer period came, and little blonde, blue-eyed white boy held up his hand and said, what's the buzz? And I'm thinking, oh my god, what's the answer to that? Hmm. You know, and I said, well, do you remember the sound the bee makes? And then we all get to make that sound and to talk about, don't you pay attention when you hear that sound? And but it was such a challenge, and it, it, it helped me to grow in spiritual and emotional maturity to realize that, to try to get a message. I wanted to write a book that would emphasize boys and with the images of black boys, but loving one another, uh, learning. When the book was first came into being, there was no boy reading a book, and you know, I went to my publishers and said, you know, black males are quickly becoming the most illiterate group in our society. We need an image of a boy reading a book. And, you know, we went back to the drawing board. And Chris Roska, the incredible illustrator, um, you know, created an image of a boy reading a book. And parents wrote to me saying, we're so glad that these boys are not just running and jumping, because they're doing a lot of running and jumping in the book as well, um, but that he's sitting alone and he's reading, all quiet and still. And that, that's the power of language and of writing, you know, that you can have that impact on someone's life or not. I was telling Carlin about when I write something and I think it's so great and nobody notices. And I think, <laughs> wow, I, I thought that was the best part. Well, one of the things about being, uh, you know, when you write for an academic audience, um, often that's a pretty small audience and, you know, a, a lot of journals, you know, our traditional journals, I don't know how it is in literary stuff, but in economics, you know, there are five people reading them. <laughs> you feel pretty good about it, you know, it's great work, but, and that's why I'm kind of curious about the public intellectualism is because you can reach a larger group of people and maybe and influence them differently, maybe not quite as profoundly, but... Um, you, you, can, you can get to a whole lot more people with your ideas. Well, I do not use the internet. I don't have, um, I never have done email or anything like that. I, um, and when I recently at the New School in New York did a conversation with a television celebrity thinker, Melissa Harris Perry, mm -hmm. and they asked me, oh, 
are you willing, if we want to streamline, of course, I didn't have any idea what streamlining was. And I was like, okay. And then later when I heard that 300,000 people had listened to or looked at um, the dialogue between us, I was in awe. The average book in our nation sells maybe 2,000 copies, and that doesn't even tell us who reads it or you know, what have you. And to realize that you could reach that many people in a short time a frame of time just really shook me up. It shook my world because that's an awesome thing. And I was somebody said to me, oh, but they weren't, people weren't listening to the whole thing. And I said, but you know, um, sometimes we're transformed by a quote. Um, I have this ridiculous looking sheep at my house and it's because I'm deeply moved by the admonition, if you love me, feed my sheep. And that's for me a call to service and sustainability and sharing. But a lot of times when I meditate, it's just on a sentence. Uh, pastor saying, your heart has to be ready to handle the weight of your calling. That's been my meditation for a month, trying to understand what he means by that as I'm reading Richard Foster's book, Celebration of Discipline. But so to me, a whole new world has opened up to me. The <laughs> fact that, wow, you can really get people to at least hear something maybe that you're saying. I'd like to ask you a little bit about some of the work that you've done. And both of you have been identified as, as working in the area of feminist studies, women, women's studies, gender studies. And, and um, I, I'm curious about, you know, the word feminism is sort of very, it's a pregnant word. It, it means many things to many different people. And I'm curious to hear from each of you. What does feminism mean to you? What does that mean? Well, one of my best-selling books is Feminism is for Everybody, and in it I propose what I think is a very simple definition of feminism is that it's a movement to end sexism, sexist domination and exploitation, to challenge patriarchy. It's not gendered. That's why the book is called Feminism is for Everybody. It's as much for males as it is for females, and I, I think that that's a visionary approach to feminism to recognize that we all need feminism. I don't know if you know comedians, like there was a big skit on Saturday Night Live with Louis C.K. Mm -hmm. and he was doing a skit about God and he was like, well, you know, uh, God, our father, but I'm, I have a question, where is our mother? <laughs> and, he, and it was such a funny, but it was a very kind of feminist take, questioning, uh, interrogation of the patriarchal roots of Christianity and that a comedian can do that in you know five minutes or eight minutes, it's pretty awesome. He was like, I want my mother. <laughs> and then he said finally that if, 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 our, if God is um, you know, our father here on earth, perhaps it's our mother who reigns in heaven and we're just spending a weekend here with dad. <laughs> I wish I could stay up late enough to watch Saturday Night Live. Well, I wish too. <laughs> I watch it on the, a friend's computer in the daytime. Though I stay up late reading. So if we go back 40 years and you're at Stanford and, and you're this allegedly angry writer at the, at the time, uh, how has your, you don't seem angry to me by the way, uh, how has your thinking about what feminism is, how, how has that changed over that, that well, period of time? Well, I think that what is most evident to me is that this amazing life that I have the capacity to live within is for me so directly tied to feminist thinking and practice and that you know that's what I want to share with males and females and with my students the way in which challenging outmoded notions of gender can transform our lives and um, I think that as I have gotten older I've also gotten a little sadder about um, kind of the loss of the early fervor of feminism, of qu the questioning. Like say just in the area of female dress. When I'm in the airport and I see all these women teetering along on their stilettos on those very slick floors, I think, what happened to our, our efforts to have women have a healthier sense of beauty? So, you know, I will go back to the new school next month for a week in residence and really look at some of the things that's happening with the black female body. So I, I think that where I see our deepest failure as feminists is with children and with girls. That, you know, the, the capitalist 
consumer market has really targeted girls and has targeted them with a very traditional fem feminine sense of being a girl, like with princesses, and it's tied to, of course, you've got to have your princess dress, you've got to have your crown, you've got to have everything. And I look at that and I think, where did we go wrong? Or did we not do enough? Because early on, I think a lot of people have forgotten, there was a tremendous passion for children and for changing the way that we teach children. I remember there were books to free children. And I can tell you, writing a book that was aimed to be pro-boy but not pro-patriarchy was really, really hard. How do you use language in such a way that you praise being a boy, but you don't elevate being a boy over being a girl? And I think that those were the deep theoretical and practical challenges. But there's hardly any addressing of children, which is why the media has preyed upon the children so in the images we see. How do you see, each of you, see America's future with, with feminism, race issues, inequality? Are you optimistic? It's not, you sounded as if maybe you weren't. Well, I am optimistic that the heart of democracy is to love justice, and that's what I'll be talking about some tonight. That if we want to change many of the things that are ch corrupting our democracy, we have to return to loving justice. I think that you know when people do the Martin Luther King I Have a Dream speech, they forget how much he wrote about the meaningfulness of justice. And when I was growing up, you know, I was put in these little contests to write about democracy and how do we become democratic and justice was a very key word to that and I think we have to return to emphasizing the love of justice and we see that in things like Occupy Wall Street um, those young people who had a sense of justice that we hope they, they can unite with economic wisdom um, that we hope they can use their fervor for dissent to think differently about economics in our world. And I think it's telling that, you know, Bell Hooks was one of the books that they held up as well as Cornell was very involved because I think that at heart people want to have lives of optimal well-being and that the question we all face is how can all of us have that right to have lives of optimal well-being. That's uh, that's that is optimistic. Carlin, are you as optimistic? You meet with young people all the time. Well, at the top of my intro to women's and gender studies syllabus, there is a bell hooks quotation that says, "Feminism moves us from lovelessness to loving, and uh, there is no love without justice." And so I f I, f I feel. Uh, especially given um, our talk today about the Bell Hooks Institute, the, the notion of dreaming and dreaming big, the story of the Cassandra Voss Center, these are big dreams. So I feel hopeful about those dreams. Absolutely, and when we look at Nelson Mandela, when we look at the revival of passion for Dr. King's work and writing, we see where does hope reside, and I think at the heart, you know, there's a tremendous longing for spiritual revival. And let's face it, you can't get any more radical than Jesus. And so I think that there's the hope that lies in our religious experience, in our religious life. That um, I often, I, my, one of my first lectures I gave in gender studies was, is God a feminist? And my answer was, yes, and I'm really glad because nobody else wants to be. <laughs> Well, thank you to both of you so much for, for this wonderful conversation. I've, I've very much enjoyed it. And I hope you've enjoyed our show, too. Until next time, I'm Kevin Quinn. Best wishes for good conversations from St. Norbert College.